So I push the button and we wait for the check marks and it just says you are live. So nice. let's, uh, if anyone, if anyone out there is watching, give us a thumbs up or a hello in the comments. Usually takes a minute or two for people to start filtering in. Oh, I can see that people are starting to arrive. So we've got John Mill here this, this week, and we're talking about uh, hiring your buyer and having more control over an exit plan. So let's uh, let's introduce the show and we'll, we'll get things underway. I'm uh, David C. Barnett, and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the broadcast podcast YouTube channel where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses while controlling risk. So if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day, or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things, I talk to interesting people, and I answer your questions every week right here. So be sure to hit like, be sure to hit subscribe, and let's get to it. Awesome. This, uh, so today we have John Mill, and, um, and, and just before we get started, John, I, I wanna let everyone know that I heard all the comments about the focus on my camera being off. So I, I got rid of the old camera, the people over at Amazon were good enough to send me a new one that we're using today. and. And it's a little bit of a different setup here for the for the studio. I hope everyone likes it. Um, and the other thing too is my my uh, holiday chat 2021. There's still six spots available. So if anyone's interested in doing one of those, um, go to my blog davidcbarnett.com. If you scroll back to the end of November, you'll see the announcement there that holiday chat is open. And uh, if you want a one hour one on one with me at 75 percent off the regular price, there's still six of them left. There, there are six, right? Um, John, how are you today? I'm excellent. How about yourself, David? I'm doing really well. I'm doing really well. Um, well you know, I think we should start off. I know you and I have chatted before. You were one of the guest right. speakers in the in the Business Buyer Adventure Group Coaching Program. Um, but for those of you who don't know you, let's get a little bit into your background. You actually had a, a long career um, involved in, in the law and, and taxation, correct? Yes, I was a tax lawyer, tax litigation lawyer uh, for owner managed businesses for about 25 years. Um, and I, I was exposed to a lot of things as a tax lawyer. I, I, I gained expertise in uh, business valuation because you have to cross examine business valuation experts. So you're forced to kind of kind of learn what you're doing for the cross examination. So there's a number of areas I worked on you know, buy sell transactions, planning buy sell transactions, tax planning, the whole the whole gamut. And and so, you know, you're crossing paths with all those entrepreneurs and business owners. Were you correct? So were you defending them from the from uh, the tax collectors or, or which side of the table were you on here? Y yes. Yeah, I was it, when you're in litigation, tax litigation is very specialized. And yes, you're on. It's the defense, although it's the only defense in the world where you have to uh, to prove your case. There's no such thing as the CRA. CRA can simply make what's called assumptions. They can make guesses and you have to disprove them. And if you're unable to disprove them, like it's, it's, it, it can be nasty sometimes. And, but that's the way that it is. Uh, CRA has a, has a pretty, pretty powerful weapon there. So innocent until proven guilty, except in taxes. I uh, correct guilty until yeah. proven innocent is exactly <laughs> right. That's right. But does that surprise you really, David? No, <laughs> honestly, no. come on. <laughs> uh, so, so this, so throughout your career, of course, you got to know business owners and entrepreneurs. Can you, Correct. can you explain when you started to become more interested in sort of the, um, you know, the, the, in helping to work on deals and helping people strategize their exits? Yeah. So I think that I just grew up with my clients and, uh, as they got white hair, apparently I did too. And then they started becoming interested in, you know, like 20 years ago, I would have had no idea about succession or any of those things. So it was just a natural thing. But having this expertise in business valuation, I started looking at the valuations. And I'm going, this this just doesn't, you know, this makes no sense to me. Like I didn't understand why the business valuations, small business valuations were the way they were. It just didn't make any sense. And so, you know, we've talked, I've talked about this quite a lot, actually, on on uh, this channel, where I discuss the fact that 
small businesses are risky. The valuations tend to be quite low. Most sellers, when they find out what their business is going to sell for, they don't get very excited, right? And it, it usually takes some degree of motivation to really want to move to the next chapter of life in order for somebody to say, I'm going to sell. Because to your point, the valuations are low and it means it's much more profitable just to keep the thing and run it until right. something happens where you can't. And so right. you were looking at some of these valuations saying there should be more. And so tell us a little bit about your journey. I mean, you you started to investigate this. Yeah. So uh, it, the, the problem was, is that I'm also an entrepreneur. And so I was entrepreneurial. I put myself through law school because I thought that that would be a good seat at the table. That was my motivation. And then I thought tax would be a better seat at the table, which, as it turned out, was correct. And so I, I understood the entrepreneurial side and I just couldn't believe that, you know, you have a good, enduringly profitable business that's been in business for 20 years and someone wants to offer you three times earnings. So that's why I mean, there's a really simple reason that people want to stay in business, because if they stay in business for 10 years, that's 10 times earnings. Right. And then they can still sell for three. So, I mean, it, it, but it just, it really, it really doesn't make any sense. And, and there's some really compelling evidence, David, and I'm, a, I'm, I'm all about evidence, right? That's, that's, you know, that's just burned into me. And, and that's, it's all about the evidence. And there's some very compelling evidence that those valuation multiples, and do we need to uh, explain multiple and how that works, or is that well? I don't think so. But let's let's talk a little bit about the size of businesses that you're talking about. Who typically would have be been the clients, like as far as maybe annual revenue or number of employees? Like how big a business are we talking about? Yeah. So I always worked with owner managed businesses, so mm -hmm. businesses that were from solopreneurs up to say I would work with like probably businesses of up to maybe 40 to 50 employees. That was basically the sweet spot. I occasionally worked in a special, was invited in or whatever on a much larger business, but that wasn't my clientele. Okay. And so a lot of these businesses would have sales probably into the millions, but not 40, 50. That's right. Like, That's right. So Main Street into the lower middle market, we could say. Yeah, that uh, absolutely correct. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly my my sweet spot. So and I also worked in Windsor, Ontario, which is not a major center like Toronto. OK. And so, um, you know, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And if we're talking about multiples of EBITDA, for example, like 3x correct. for one of those lower middle market businesses is pretty correct. typical. Yes. Um, and and so you know, to your point, you want to own it for 10 years because then you get 10 times the earnings. Uh, I've, I've had many a business sellers say to me, well, if that's all I can get for it, I'd rather hang on to it. It doesn't make sense to sell because I can keep it for a couple of years and get the same money and then still have it to sell. Right. right. And so the reason I think that buyers don't go into higher valuations is because as a buyer, I look at that and I go, okay, so how certain can I be that the scenario and the circumstances that have led to this cash flow will carry on? And that's that's the risk component. And, and people are willing to look two, three years into the future, but people aren't willing to commit themselves further than that. And so I think, you know, that to me is the basis of why the valuations end up being low. And so would you concur? And then what what's the solution to that? Yeah, so so I don't disagree with you, but I think there's a, a an additional factor that you could look at, okay. and and it's it's fair market value. So having litigated those words, fair market value, you you get a deeper understanding over many years. So fair market value is a hypothetical number; it does not exist. It's based on assumptions, sort of like CRA in a sense. Um, and, and so it's based on the market and it's fair market value is really what an investor, somebody who wants to invest their money will pay for this stream of cash flow. Now you're correct. And I came to the understanding about risk. You talk about dealing with risk that if you were to sit down and try to scientifically design the perfect, you know, the perfect storm of the max, how to maximize risk in an investment, it would be very difficult to come up with something better than the small owner managed company, 
right? Because you you have all the classic risks, right? You have mm -hmm. the you know it's all dependent on the owner, right? There's no systems in place. The the intellectual property and the for the business walks out the door at the end of every night. If the owner leaves, it collapses. You know, there's banks banks are not really interested in lending much money. So all of the classic risks are are there, and and that's that's why. However. There is a really important exception and a very big exception. Oh, should I tell What's you? What's that? <laughs> yeah, there. Thank you. <laughs> I thought we should have a dramatic pause. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, awesome. That worked. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'll remember that. The next time we do one of these, we'll get this. We'll get this little routine down. So no. So the very dramatic exception is is called the enduringly profitable business, right? So if a business is enduringly has been enduringly profitable for 20 years, as many of these are like there's thousands and thousands of them, right? Hundreds of thousands, maybe right smart people that have, you know, professional professionalized business owners, right? Who who really do, you know, work their business smart, they think about it, they do the right things, and they built a good niche. So if a business has been enduringly profitable at above average profitability, which a lot of businesses are for 20 years, and there's nothing on the horizon to suggest that that's going to change, then it's just is not true that the risk is the same. And, and the evidence that I like to use, there's more evidence, but the easiest to grasp is the book that's written. I know it's your favorite book, uh, the, the Harvard Guide to uh, Buying a Small Business, right? Harvard wrote a book, Harvard professors telling their students that small businesses, enduringly profitable, say, these ones, these this category of enduringly profitable, 20-year enduringly profitable businesses are an exciting third path for Harvard MBA students who just dropped mm. $200,000 on their degree, went to the best school in the world, and their professors are telling them that the third path that they believe is better than risky startups and more interesting than a big, you know, uh, company career path, which are the other two, that this small business, enduringly small business, enduringly profitable small business, is the third path that they should consider. And one of they quote unquote and out of the book, one of the best investments you can find. So so. So it seems to me that it's really, really hard to reconcile somebody telling me that, the but they know that the valuation is going to come in at four times because it doesn't matter. Valuation, this is my concern with what you were saying earlier about, oh, the standard risk. Mm. The valuations in my mind are biased and unfair because they don't differentiate between the two types of businesses. And Harvard explains this quite this is why I love the book, right? They're basically giving us the formula that they're using. And, and in that book, and I mean, you joked, it's one of my favorite books. I just think it's mistitled because they, they, they talk about, they use the word term small business, but they're really talking about lower middle market. Yeah. Well, you and I had, had this discussion too. Yeah. Yeah. Businesses <laughs> with 10 to 15 million of revenue. Yes. And so yeah, that's right. Uh, sometimes people will read that book and try to apply that to the you know main street and it's not entirely applicable, but the um, the uh, they're saying that there are these sort of rough diamonds, these unpolished diamonds that people can go out and find, and that because they're going to be compared with you know a lot of other comparable businesses in the same SIC code, that you know they're going to end up with a, some multi valuation that's attached to that. My my concern when I look at a business, even though it's an exceptional business if it has above average profits and everything seems to be great <clears throat> because of the financing component, there can still be a difficulty for anyone to pay a higher valuation uh, because it won't cash flow, right? Because the, the financing tools may not be able, may not be there to be put in place. Correct. But I think that you're going to talk a little bit about that too, right? Yeah. So I think what you're, you're talking about is that again, the fair market value valuation of what the hypothetical investor would pay is what the banks rely on 
when they're deciding. So if you were to walk into a bank saying, oh, we struck this great deal and I've decided that I love this business and I want to pay a seven times multiple, the banker's going to go, nah, uh, 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 you're not, we're not financing anything above fair market value. I think that's what you're talking about in terms of financing, right? Well, but also in terms of the amortization, for example. So you, that, in, in my experience, you have some hard limits on amortization. So in the States, you know, SBA financing can go out 10 years a lot of the time. Um, in, in Canada, it's hard to get a lot of bankers to go beyond five or seven, depending on you know, what they're right. looking at. And so if you pay too much in that short a period of time, it might not cash flow. Well, if, it, if you have 10 years, right, and assuming everything stays equal, then you can afford to pay 10x. You just pay the pay the EBITDA, live on the salary, right? So if if you did that, but the question, what I d did, my response or my answer to this was to work on creating value. That's where that's mm. what I'm that's what I'm really interested in is how do we create value? And and so, um, do you want to segue into that now? Yeah, because it, you know. Um, I, I think that a lot of, and, and, and I mean, I've talked with people about this before, and I, and I think a lot of this stuff is probably, you know, sort of on, on the agenda here for what you want to talk about. But um, I the, the risk, as far as I'm concerned, can be removed when the buyer happens to already know how to run the business, right? And this is, and this is the strong theme that, that you get across in your book. Um, I know that on some of the deals where I've helped people make a plan and do their forecasting and whatnot. And it was a, a management buyout that the bankers were much more uh, open to, to new and different things. Um, and usually the, there's a tight relationship between the buyer and seller. So that then opens the door to even greater flexibility, maybe for seller financing too. Yeah, and I, you raise a good point. And I think that in my mind, it's almost like there's two separate things. One is the risk of the business, and then there's this issue of the buyer knowing how to operate it. I see those as separate things. And I think that the risk really is camouflaging the fact that the buyer doesn't know how to operate it. I think that's the real issue, right? It's called risk, but the real underlying issue is the buyer doesn't know how to operate it. And that's really what's creating the risk. Yeah. Right. Because Everyone, everyone's assuming there could be a bumpy road until the new owner gets, you know, gets their bearings. Right. That makes a Well, I don't think they think it through that far, but but yeah, they're just assuming there's going to be a bumpy road. Right. And and basically, in any case, and that's what what Harvard is relying on. And and so I'd, I'd like to add a kind of a nuance to the Harvard thing, too. I agree with you. It's lower middle market. And, and that that's entirely true. But from my experience, the same thing happens, and uh, you and I had a friendly kind of challenge where we talked about you'd sent me a pizza story, a pizza shop case with a three hundred thousand dollar valuation, and and whether we could work on, and maybe we'll get to that later on. But in my mind, if there's what I really think is really important, is what I call the solid foundation. And so, what I mean by a solid foundation is that. It, it's quite an it's quite a marvelous thing to behold a, a business with a 20 year track record of, of enduringly profitable because, you know, according to the E myth, there's different numbers and different stats, but the E myth says that 90% of businesses are out of business in the first 10 years. So it's a 10% survival rate. So that means that 100% of these businesses that have been in business enduringly profitable survive the e -myth cut and are part of that 10%. And that's a pretty impressive, just on its own, it's pretty impressive. And so what that, what, what I have seen is the reason is, is that what I call the solid foundation. So I, I like to visualize it as a, as a, you know, you, you, you dig the foundation, you put in the forms and you pour the concrete and it is solid. And the reason I say it's a solid foundation is because it's sitting there, but it has not been developed. It's still in its foundational stage. And the reason it hasn't been developed is because the it's the owner manager and owner the owner manager himself or herself is the constraint on growth. The fact that mm -hmm. the owner is the manager is the constraint. It is, it is what is holding the business back 
and what caps out and limits the growth and it grows to a certain size and then coasts along very nicely for the next 20 years. We call these lifestyle businesses. Yeah, and I've seen this. I've seen this many times, and and uh, it, it actually, to your point about seeing these businesses as opportunities, I've seen people that have backgrounds, sort of middle management backgrounds, where they're they're used to dealing with systems and processes and checklists and things like this in in managing within maybe a big organization or the military or something. Uh, and they'll come in and buy these businesses and start implementing that kind of stuff. And they're the ones that are then able to achieve growth again because mm-hmm. they're, they implement the things that the, mm-hmm. that the seller was missing, that they, they didn't have in place. Or that they just didn't have. They weren't missing them. Like I talked to a, a, a guy about uh, had a really, really good business. And he was uh, in, in, he was, he was uh, sold and serviced large industrial gas ovens uh, in in institutional restaurants and things like that. And so I talked to him one day and I said, well, is there anything you could do to increase the the business that you have? And he says, well, yeah, I could always do refrigeration. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. Why aren't you doing that? He said, well, I could go off on Wednesday afternoons. <laughs> And I said, I said, so let, let me ask you, so to, you have all the, you wouldn't need to increase the size of your building, right? And, and really all you would need, you have the client, you, you've told me you have this 2,400 client list, 2,400 clients over 40 years. I said, can you call these guys up and talk to oh, every single one of them? I said, so what would you have to, he said, well, I just have to get some trucks. Yeah, he, 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 he doesn't have business. he doesn't have the motive, motivation. Right. He's not but out there's there so hungry. many that's yeah. the, so many businesses are out there exactly in that same situation, right? That's the cap. That's the opportunity of the solid foundation. Twenty four a client list of twenty four hundred customers, and all you have to do is add trucks. There's a lot of opportunities out there like that, right? And and you and and so. So the person that comes in from the military or a large company understanding processes and procedures doesn't need to understand the business because they're going to go in and learn the business and learn the business by putting in the processes and procedures. And that's that's really the that's really, I think, the secret to the to the whole value creation thing. I mean, you could you could basically stop there, but you can we can talk about it further, of course, but. You know, basically, that's that's the key component. John, we've got people that are uh, that are sending us little messages. We got Tomo's waving his hand, but Tomo, we need the thumbs up. We need you to <laughs> like. And we've got uh, Paul, who's telling us hello, hello, and hi, Paul. How are you again? Like, hit the thumbs up or the heart, whatever platform you're watching. Um, so. So in your book, Hire Your Buyer, you you lay out a plan for business owners to increase the value and to also solve the problem of a buyer not knowing how to run the business by hiring the person with a, let's call it a career path towards acquisition. Mm -hmm. And so talk to us a little bit about that because I mean, I've I've seen it happen. There's a, a video on my channel where I talk about a BDC case where it's actually an advertisement of theirs where they describe this exact thing. You know, where, where somebody hires somebody, they become the manager, and then the seller, because they trust them and know that they're capable, is then able to help them arrange the financing and, and basically do be- to remove obstacles for that buyer to be able to buy the business. And so talk to us a little bit about this and, and, and how have you been working with people then to implement this directly since you wrote, wrote your book? Yeah, and the only thing that I I don't do is is we don't bother with financing because it just is so far hasn't been necessary. So so basically, so starting at the beginning, you you cover you covered a lot of territory. You covered the like the whole middle of the book, <laughs> <laughs> but that's great. So so the idea simply is is we have this solid foundation. We have the owner who wants to go off on Wednesday afternoons, and we have these all these unexplored. Uh, activities. And also there's another thing I call it uh, popping the champagne champagne cork. 
And the reason is, is because what happens, even aside from saying, okay, I could sell, I could sell refrigeration pretty easily. That's one thing, but just, just the foundation itself, because it's been constrained by the owner, as soon as you start putting in new management, you immediately have like this rush of pent up business. And I've seen it over and over again. And that's why I call it popping the champagne cork because you just, and what we're looking for in the sort of uh, our base case, right? Our base case, we're looking for 15% annual growth. That's what we're looking for. And so why do we want 15% annual growth? And I've seen much more, but 15% is, let's talk about that because I want to talk about really realistic numbers that are achievable. In five years with 15% growth, you double your EBITDA in five years, okay? Now, if you can put in your management systems that you put in place that we're talking about, and you have a solid growth record and you have a good prospects, now you can be looking at doubling your multiple. And that's, that's where we real that. If you double your multiple plus double your EBITDA, that's 400% increase in value. So, so let's, let's, uh, let's pull back from that a little bit. Yeah. So a lot of the times when we're talking about acquiring a small business, you know, I've said many times you, you pay a seller for what you get, not for where you're taking it. Right. Because if I buy a business and I'm the one that has to do the work to create the 15% growth, then I want the benefit of that. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what, what you're talking about, like a lot of public stock valuation models that I've seen have a, a component, there's some part of the formula where growth goes in, mm -hmm. right? And they include the, the you know expected growth as part mm -hmm. of the value model for that stock. And so this is kind of like what you're doing is you're, is you're saying, if we can figure out how to do this transaction in such a way that we can bring the growth component into this, mm -hmm. then, then it would change things. And I guess, mm -hmm. I guess the, you know, from the buyer's point of view, um, if they're going to pay a lot more for it, I guess that they would want to have much more of a certainty in the fact that the growth is actually going to be achieved, right? Yeah, so this is this is a new model. And uh, so it, a, a, a number of the standard assumptions that normally apply don't apply here. it's it's a different it's a different model. so so let 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 me explain when you and we did skip over some stuff. so, I sort of went to the end, so now I'll go back to the beginning. So, what, what, a lot of a lot of employees really don't have a, you know, employment right now is not a great place to be unless you have some kind of really good skill trade or good education or something, right? So, to be an average employee generally is not the greatest opportunity, and employees don't have capital; they can't buy businesses. So, employees don't have great opportunities, but there are lots of great employees out there that can work hard and, and want to create a better life for themselves and will do that. And so when you have, so let's go back to our definition of fair market value, because now I'll really dive deeply into the uh, theory, which, which might be interesting. So fair market value is a made up hypothetical assumption, right? That that's, it's just the evaluator makes these assumptions about risk and comes up with the number. Now, what happens, and here's what's interesting, and I, you and I have never talked about this, but here's what's interesting. What happens, David, if you change the assumptions? What happens if you say, okay, this is not, the assumptions are no longer that this is an arm's length uh, purchaser investor mm -hmm. who knows nothing about the business, who who is going to pay cash on closing, right? Those are the assumptions in fair market value. What if we change those assumptions? What do we say, okay, this is an employee who would never again in their life have an opportunity to buy a business like this, right? And they do not have to pay any money down. There's no money down here. And they can pay it over time. And the business itself is going to pay 100% of the purchase price, right? It's an interesting question. And, and, and uh, let's talk about words because you, you're talking about fair market value and the assumptions behind fair market value. And you know, when I do work with clients and I'm looking at a business and what it might sell for, I actually don't evaluate them for fair market value. I evaluate them for most probable selling price, which is different. Correct. Correct. Be because um, fair market value 
honestly would be a market where a buyer and seller with both with good information, neither under compulsion would come to an Correct. agreement. That's right. And, and the problem is, is when you're dealing with human beings, right. uh, it's, it's hard not for, for one of them not to be under compulsion, right? Right. And so most of the time, if we know that businesses sell for a fairly low multiple, the seller must be under some kind of motivation, motivating circumstance, a compulsion of some degree in Correct. order to want to enter that market. Correct. And so that reinforces the low valuation. What you're talking Correct. about is if you say, I'm going to create an opportunity for someone with no capital to buy a business and take care of the financing problem, you know, I could easily see how the compulsion would shift to the buyer because now they're being offered this incredible opportunity, right? Well, yeah, and and yeah, sorry, did I cut you off? I'm not sure. Well, no, but th but that would then cause your your number, whatever we're going to call it, to then shift upwards. Absolutely. Yeah. So so and but and also what it's also going to do is the other assumption in my scenario is that the seller would not otherwise sell. So the seller, you just said it yourself, right? He'd have to be under a compulsion. Well, the sellers I'm dealing with are not yet under that compulsion. Mm. And I have gone into situations where the seller has left it too late and the employees are now angry and the employees have seen a couple of failed. I saw, saw one where the employees saw the 70 year old guy and he had failed a couple of times in sales. And the employee looked at me and says, are you kidding me? I know exactly what this business will sell for. And there's no possibility I'm paying not participating in anything and paying a, a penny more than that. And for my loyalty, in fact, I think I deserve a discount. But that was that was way water under the bridge. That was there was no that was done, right? Yeah. But in, in the other situations, this is usually young, enthusiastic people. And and here's here's why I think it's fair and equitable and it's not taking advantage of anybody. Because the the employees do not have to work any harder than they otherwise would and they're going to be paid there's no reduction in salary they're going to be paid salary maybe even better salary right but what they are going to do is they're going to work smarter and how are they going to work smarter well they're going to work smarter in exactly the same way that your military veteran or your big company person who understands systems and understands those things is going to come in and work smarter and be much more productive and not work harder. So are, are you often working with one individual buyer who's amongst the employees or are you looking at a lot of groups like it's uh, been the last few have been two buyers, pairs of buyers. That seems right. to be pretty popular. And owners like that idea that there's there's two. And that just just I just haven't had a situation with more, but I'm sure that will come up. Okay. And uh, sorry, I, I I cut you off there. So yeah. so you you've got you've got the um, the the managers now are buying in. They're vested. They could they can start acting as though they're in a position of equity. Where they, so let's they, let's they let, let's care let's a little bit more, right? Let, let's 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 talk about that. First of all, first of all, caring. Okay, well, let's go back to motivation one hundred and one. Money does it, money is not motivating. In the long term, money is is gives you spikes of adrenaline, but it's like a lottery win, right? It it, it wears off. Money, you need to find mon motivated people. So we want people that are hard workers and already intrinsically motivated. Those are the people we're looking for. The fact that we're offering the business does not compel them to work harder. It might for a little while to kind of give a good appearance, but over time it will not. We want people who are intrinsically motivated. So where we start is that we figure out, okay, what, what, what do we have to take it to? And usually the base formula is the 15% a year and looking over a five-year term. So usually what we say is, look, the managers have to prove themselves. And so what they, we want to start doing is start working. And this is where I would work with the business to say, okay, here now, Instead of calling the military veteran in, we'll call me in and I'll come in with my bag of systems and tricks and 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 start training people how to how to systematize the business, if you will. And then we say oh, what we want is the manager to work. And if the manager can achieve the 15 percent increase over two, a two year period, 
so consistently so that we know that this is reliable and doable, that's when we trigger the transaction. Two years is also good because a lot of times people need that for their capital gains exemption planning in Canada. Right. Um, so, um, so, so once they've demonstrated that over a two year period, and it's it's not a frivolous thing. So this is put in writing in advance so that they have they've seen their lawyer. There is a contract in place. There is an option so that if they meet these targets, then usually like in the, at the beginning, 25 percent of the shares or 20 percent of the shares is what we'd sell. And that gives them a meaningful stake in the company. And then and then you space it out over. You might go 25 percent at the five year mark, 25 percent again at the 10 at the 10 year mark and then the final at the it depends on the situation. There's many ways to save it. I often recommend to owners that, you know, listen, if you're a good person and you know you you are a good leader and a good coach, people are going to want you to stay around. So why not just stay in, keep 25% and show up once a month or whatever? And you know, that's that's a good way to go. Because if you're really competent at your business, honestly people like to have you around, right? Like Warren Buffett hasn't been thrown out yet, right? Mm. So, you know, I think, I think I, to me, that's the, that's the best option that I like to see is that the owner stays in for 25%. And hopefully that 25% in, if we keep even at 15%, it will be worth substantially more than the entire business was when we started the, pro, the process after 10 to 15 years, so. Yeah, and, and I think, the key takeaway for me, and and I mean, if people want to get into this more deeply, obviously they should they should buy the book, hire your buyer, which is on Amazon out there, right? Mm -hmm. But but the key takeaway for me for this is one of the things that I've always found very frustrating about being involved in this business is that it requires an owner to actually want to engage in some kind of plan. And, mm -hmm. and if you're out there watching and you own a business, this is the most important thing. Uh, living forever is not an exit plan, right? It, it, you've got to actually figure out what you're going to do, especially if you find yourself owning one of these enduringly profitable businesses. There's mm -hmm. there's different ways to get out. And I, I can I can see, I, you know, I can empathize a little bit with someone who owns one of these businesses. Uh, and if they were to come across that Harvard Business Review book and read about how somebody is going to set their you know, sights on their business because it's, you know, going to be a steal of a deal. There's an interesting comment just came into the chat here from uh, from a friend from down under from Reese uh, down in Australia up early in the morning. And he says the level and volume of education around small business buying and selling these days is also much so much higher than previous generations. Buyers are more educated than before and their level of due diligence and critical thinking is also deeper, often widening the gap between the seller and the buyer. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. In fact, when I first started to, to get into this back in 2008, um, I would regularly run into people who were um, more experienced or people who had done deals, you know, 5, 10, 15 years before. And I found a lot of instances where people said, you know, I sold for too little or I way overpaid, et cetera. The, the information just wasn't out there. Right. It is today. You know, people can do so much more research today and learn. Well, about stuff than they quite, could. yeah, quite frankly, the Harvard business book is a really good manual for somebody that wants to be a, an acquirer. It's written for what people that are called searchers. Yeah. And the way that works is that an MBA graduate will become a searcher and go out and set up a private a, a single purpose private equity fund where the investors will put up the money to buy the business the investors will pay the uh searcher the the mba graduate like eighty thousand a year simply to search and the time horizon is 18 months why would they pay eighty thousand a year for somebody for 18 months i wondered that at first that didn't really make sense but then i realized that is way, way less expensive than the brokerage fees would be if they had to hire a broker to do the deal. So I thought, oh, okay, that does make sense, right? They're, they're um, in a way, they are, sorry, guys, I hit the camera. In, in a way, they are, they are create, they're almost insourcing um, uh, this, this, um, this function, like, um, yeah, 100%. They, 
Yeah, like I've I've uh, actually run across bigger companies before. There's one that I've done business with in the in the in the trash removal industry, and they actually had on the inside uh, a C level position, and that person's job was to seek out and do acquisitions. That's yeah. just how they were growing their company. Well, so larger actually, companies, that's really common. Yeah, they'd have a, a VP who was just doing this, mm -hmm. and for for a, an investor, a couple of high net worth people who wanted to do the same thing, investing in a search fund would deliver the same kind of result. And and it could result in failure, but I mean, it, well, that's, you know, that's, obviously if you're going to be in this kind of position, that that amount of money is probably not going to hurt you that much. Yeah. So that's, that's what I was uh, going back to the comment that we read about, you know, buyers being much more educated. Well, one of the reasons is that before they start the buying process, they're a lot more educated. They have an MBA from Harvard. I mean, there's and there's that's a big business. That search fund business is billions and billions of dollars, right? So it's it's there's a lot of people out there now that that are yes, exactly right because because the word is out now that these small businesses really are in their intrinsic value is much much higher than their fair market value. Right. So one of the other points, though, and, and, and we'll get to some more questions as they as I see people are sending them in. Um, you talk about the simplicity of the deal. And then you mentioned just a few minutes ago how you haven't had to go and find financing yet. And so maybe you can you can talk to that a little bit. So let's deal with financing first. Um, so because the deals are based on cash flow, so we're growing the cash flow. And the essential concept, the simple concept is, okay, uh, okay, you're the owner, right? What we're going to do is we're going to, over a five-year period, we're going to increase your cash flow. We're going to increase the value by 400% over fair market value. Then we're, gonna, we're not going to double the multiple again in the, the next five years, but we will double the EBITDA again. So now we're at eight times by we're 10 years out. So that gives us a lot of money. So Whatever you own now, the owner, whatever value you have, that's fixed. That's yours and that's untouchable. But basically the growth after that, you share that with the buyers, hmm. right? And so so as the buyers, once they get, let's say they get their 25% of shares, they get a dividend of 25% and that dividend roots through to pay their purchase price, right? Yep. And that usually pays out in, and that's why we don't need financing because you just, you just the money is the business is creating the money. Yeah, which it would do anyway, even if there was a bank loan. If, if the buyers had to borrow the money, they would the business would have to produce Correct. the cash flow to repay the bank. And basically all that's happening is that the ownership Correct. portions are changing sometimes gradually over time over Correct. the course of this process. And the cash flow of the business is just being directed you know, one way or the other, uh, you know, directed to the new owners who are then in turn giving the, the money probably to the old owner for more shares or however it's done. Is it, do you do, you do a lot of deals where an incremental portion of shares transfers each year yeah. or, yeah. Yeah, okay. um, well, normally what I've done is the after two years is the first tranche, five, 10, and then sometimes 15. Okay. Usually, usually, but you could, there's nothing to prevent you from doing it every year or every two years or whatever, whatever anybody wants. It's completely flexible. All right. So. I, I, I think it's great. And, and, and so in your practice, you're working with people who want to execute this. Yes. So I wanted to go back to your point about the simplicity of the deal, but sure. first I, I just wanted to address a point you raised earlier, which is a good point about why would I, as a buyer want to work hard, to increase the value of a company and have to pay more. So generally, a couple of times I've heard that, to me, that kills the deal. I'm done. I don't want to work with that person anymore if that's their if that's their attitude, right? Because that's just, the person just doesn't get it. And I, I, what I say is, listen, here's the deal. You're not going to pay anything for this company, right? Now, if we can work and build the value, in five years from now, you'll be getting a company worth $7 million. If we don't, increase the value, right? You'll be getting a company $2 million. Either way, you won't pay anything, right? But do you want to end up five years from now with a company that's worth 2 million bucks or do you want to have a company that's worth seven? Well, well, I, well hang on here. I, and I think the, the big important difference is this, is in your normal transaction, 
you have a buyer who's coming to the table with their Correct. equity, they're taking Correct. all the debt, they're borrowing, Correct. they're Correct. pushing all that money across the Correct. table. Yes. The seller's leaving with it. And so the risk position of a traditional buyer <clears throat> who wants all the growth for themselves versus someone who's doing a program that you suggest is going to be is going to be very different because um, like they they're they're going to they're not going to have this burdensome debt at the bank hanging over their head number one uh, and number two the seller is still going to be accessible to them correct right so there and presumably if they're already employees they already have an understanding of the function of the business and so there, just a lot of these risk factors just evaporate when we correct. start to think this way. Yeah, that was, I approached it from a valuation perspective and said, okay, how do we address all the risks? And just systematically went through them. Now, I see we're almost out of time. So I would like to wrap and make sure we talk about the simplicity and how easy sure. these deals are. So right off the hop, no brokerage fees. There's no due diligence, right? Because everybody knows and it's spaced over time. And the actual, when it's collaborative, the last one I did and I didn't start out to do this, but it ended up in pure flat out Warren Buffett style. The deal was on two pages and then went to the lawyers to get written up. And it, it's a very, very simple deal. You really cannot get a less expensive deal than this. I mean, you're looking, we were quoted on the one deal that the lawyers wanted, what did they want? So there was a couple because we had to do a tax plan and a couple pieces, but the total of all of it was not much more than like 30 grand. So yeah. for the whole thing, and that's whole, the whole transaction compared to what brokers and everything else. So it is a very easy deal to do because they say that in due diligence, you know, due diligence is when if you um, sell your company, then the buyer who doesn't know you sends their lawyer and their accountant in to essentially do this really extensive scorch earth audit of every piece of paper you've ever seen. And due diligence is where friends go to become enemies, they say. And it's very, very, can be very, very hostile and it can take months. And so much so that if you read enough M&A articles, you will see frequently the owner should not take their mind off the business during the due diligence period because oftentimes the valuation suffers as a result of the intensity of this due diligence period, right? It's like, it's like a crazy thing. Yes. And... You know, to a certain, I mean, the what what I teach is that with enough seller financing and enough, you know, offset risk and all this kind of thing, sure. it, it, of course, it can alleviate some of the one hundred percent some of the problems that due diligence aims to aims to rectify. But uh, I hear you, I and and but, um, but David, not everybody is as sensible as you are. <laughs> I know, I know. That's all right. I, I'm 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 hoping to infect the internet with sensibility. We'll see. If oh, oh, that's nice. That's a good goal. I like that. <laughs> I can assist you with that. Let me know. <laughs> John, where can people uh, find out more about this and and you and your services? So I have a, a pretty basic website called uh, www. intelligentwork. com because intelligent work is really the service of bringing in the military systems and things. That's I call it intelligent work. Um, and if they want to get a hold of me, my email is john at intelligentwork.com. Awesome. Um, I want to say a big thank you. Uh, yeah. there's, some, there's some questions in the in the um, in the chat from Casio. I see them, Casio. Um, not really related to tonight's topic, but uh, I think they make a great video. So watch for this video in the coming weeks and I'll answer your question that way. And um, and with that, I'm gonna say see you later, guys. And I'm um, going to play the exit reel. And, uh, right. and, and um, if you're looking for a spiffier outfit, John, there's a, there's a special coupon code here for my tailor. <laughs> and it'll help you, help you look better. Anyway, we'll see you later. Thanks for joining me. All right. Bye-bye. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses? Easy. Head over to my blog site, davidcbarnett.com, where you can learn more about me and how I work with my clients. You can learn more about my books and the online courses that I've prepared for you. You can find out about how to subscribe to my email list, the YouTube playlists, etc. There's literally hundreds of hours of content there, all for free, and I'd love for you to be my guest. 
Special thanks go out to Jeff Alpaw Customs for being my tailor. Men all around the world can look dangerous, just like me, with the help of Jeff Alpaw Customs. JeffAlpaw.com. Use the code DCB10 to save. They handle multiple currencies and ship anywhere you happen to be.